So good morning, everyone. Glad you could join me. Again, my name is Debbie, and I am here at the Math Science Nucleus. Hopefully you guys can see me waving at you at a little corner of your screen somewhere. And on your front page, you should be seeing the Fremont Unified third grade. And this is again, celebration of our earth. And our class today is the Mwekma Ohlone Foods and Ceremonies. So let's get started. Again, for more information, or if you have extra questions, you can always go to this msnucleus.org and um, your teachers have a worksheet for today. If they haven't gotten it to you, don't worry about it. They will eventually get to it. And um, again, we might have some summer activities going on. We might be doing some small tours here at the museum and at Tule Ponds. So keep an eye on that website if you're interested in that or let us know by sending us an email. All right, so to get started, our Mwekma Ohlone's, they lived here in the Bay Area um, on the East Bay for probably about 10,000 years. And we're talking about lived here 10,000 years before there were any other settlers here, before the Spanish um, invasion, before the Europeans came, before the gold rush, um, back before there was concrete here, before there were buildings, before we were around. Um, Again, they lived all through this East Bay and they spoke the Chechenyo language. And again, we will be talking about their foods and ceremonies that they used. So they had a very rich natural area, lots of resources. Again, I told you my background is in forestry and wildlife management. And I would have loved to have seen the Ohlone land then because they had such rich resources that they could live off of the land and they were very smart foresters and wildlife biologists themselves. They knew a lot about the animals and the plants to be able to successfully live on the land and not destroy it. Um, so again, the abundant food by that environment and the cultures thrived for thousands and thousands of years, about 10,000 years. And um, then that came to a screeching halt once the Spanish invasion and the European invasion came. So again, we will be looking at all of these foods. Now, if you look at this screen, I don't know if you can even identify what some of these foods are. Um, the Ohlone's ate pretty much an omnivore diet. Do you remember what an omnivore is? You're probably an omnivore and you can categorize by teeth a lot of times. You eat meat and plants. You'll eat a little bit of everything, okay? So as you look through these pictures, We'll start at the very bottom. Those round things, they look kind of like rocks. Those are actually quail eggs. Quail eggs. You can find quail eggs around here. They're actually a real kind of a sweeter. Um, flowers, nuts, and berries. Sure. The next is kind of an acorn mush. We eat stuff kind of like that, kind of like our oatmeal and all. Um, the Bing cherries and all. Sure, they had things like that. How about seaweed? Any of you guys ever try seaweed? Well, since their water area was nearby and the Bay Area is a lot larger than um, they would have access to the seaweed. They would wrap their foods up in that, um, use it for flavors. Next, those little black things you're looking at, those are mussels. So those would, not like this kind of mussel, but mussels like a clam that lives down in the salty water. And inside, it's a bivalve, inside there's a um, soft squishy animal that makes that shell and they would want, they would be after that squishy animal. Mushrooms, jellies and all made from berries. You see there's some more clams up at the top. Again, more of those that would open up. So again, a lot of different kinds of foods. All right, now here's a clip of Cafe Ohlone. I'll let you watch this and get an idea of the type of food that they would have been eating. You wouldn't know it from the outside, but tucked behind a bookstore on busy Bancroft Way in Berkeley is something very special. Hello, everybody who is here for Cafe Ohlone. We are just about to get started. Cafe Ohlone gives people a taste of the East Bay. By that, we mean the original East Bay, home of the Muwekama Ohlone tribe. We're grateful to be able to share these foods with you all, to teach you all about who we are as Ohlone people. Cafe Ohlone offers just a couple of meals a week, and the menu changes frequently. Dishes are only made from ingredients that are native to the East Bay. Hazelnuts, acorns, 
venison, salmon, these greens like the watercress that's coming up, our chia seed. Many people are surprised at that. <laughs> our food just by itself, it's inherently bougie because our traditional diet, it's so rich, it's so gourmet, it's so delicious. The pop-up restaurant opened back in 2017 as part of a larger effort to preserve the Ohlone culture. Diners call it a delicious learning experience. I'm originally from California and I don't really know a lot about the indigenous groups that were here and so just to have an opportunity to learn directly from these groups and to consume food that's different and something that I've never had before was really exciting for me. It reminds me of my ancestors too, like um, really touched me and what it really touched me too is the food, it's so delicious, really good. The experience and the food keeps the place packed. Ten years ago, it would have been hard to think of, of so many people gathered over Ohlone Foods. But this is also reflective of the changing times and also reflective of how much work has been put in to keep these ways strong. In Berkeley. So good. Candace Wen, KTVU, Fox 2 News. Okay. So I'm not sure that you're thinking that's exactly what the Ohlone's would eat, but that's our modern day version of it. Um, Vincent and all their uh, restaurant unfortunately closed because that bookstore was um, sold and closed, but they're looking for another restaurant location. So we look forward to seeing their food coming soon. Um, many of you guys as third graders, you may not be big vegetable eaters and big salad eaters, but for you teachers, I bet you're thinking that looks pretty good, huh? Okay, even those muffins and all, we'll be talking about how they made these foods. Now, at that Ohlone Cafe, they had modern day refrigerators, stoves, ovens. They could bake and cook in those. Um, they could preserve their foods. But how did the Mwekmas do that thousands of years ago? Okay, one of the first components that they would need for food prep would be fire. And this is showing you two different ways to make fire. Again, very important. So you see the one is using um, chert. It's splintering off a piece of rock and then you get a spark. And if you can get enough of a spark, then you can get your dry um, there to ignite with your fire. So you see that's one way. The other way is with this stick and the stone where they're in this double stick where they're getting a little bit of smoke to get started and it will hopefully ignite um, a little bit of, again, that dry area. So this is, again, using friction. If you take your own two hands and you rub them together, rub them fast, hard, press, lots of pressure, rub them faster, faster, faster. What happens? Do you, can you feel them getting warm? Exactly. That's what's happening with this wooden way. That's the way the friction builds up and hopefully ignites. But again, you've got to be prepared. So we do have rains in the area, so you've got to keep your little supply of dry prep ready. All right, so again, fire was important. So they did have fire to make their food, so they could roast things on top of a fire, like as if you guys have ever roasted marshmallows or cooked hot dogs on top of a fire. Um, Ohlone's did cook a lot of their food, okay, but there were different ways to cook it other than just putting it on top of a fire they developed a way to boil water and to be able to steam and boil their foods. Now you see this big rock that's coming in and it's making that water bubble and boil. Hmm, that hot rock is coming um, in from a, let's see, is getting in the fire. Then it's dipped into the water again, causing it to boil. So if you think again about how we cook and use things today, even being able to um, yeah, just cook something, you put it in a pot, right, a metal pot. And then if you're gonna move it around, you use a spatula, either plastic or metal. Um, but to get something out of a fire, again, they wouldn't have metal. So you see they're using the pieces of wood there. And on this other picture, you see that again, those hot stones would be put in as a way to steam. Okay, so again, they found lots of unique ways to cook. All right, another way would be to um, create kind of a pit. The Hawaiians kind of do this still today where you dig out an area and you put a fire or you do the hot stones, um, but then talking about containers. Look at this is some seafood that's cooked in a bark, 
bucket, if you want to think, think of that as a bark pot. You see the edges of the bark? Because that's been down in the pit. That's where it was kept warm and it was cooking. So you can see how the bark has started to burn there, but that would cook that inside food material. Pretty clever, huh? All right. Most of all, though, they had to, again, forage for their food. There weren't stores to go to. There weren't roads, no place you could easily go get something other than if you knew the land and you would have to forage. And if you did that, then it'd be pretty easy. You could snack all day if you knew what berries and nuts and things you could eat. Um, but again, this is foraging. So they had to be able to collect, prepare their food and know where to look. So this is collecting some eggs. There were many birds that they used in their diet that gave them meat as well as eggs. So we had lots of the shorebirds. And you see our mallards that are taking off there. The Canada, ge the Canada geese that's flying there. Lots of different kinds of waterfowl. Cormorants, they come in from the bay. They, big birds sometimes have their wings out drying their parasites. They would use their eggs. And then they would have these even little small birds. These are called quail. And again, you think how fast these birds move. If you've ever tried to um, catch a duck, <laughs> think about the hunting and how they would need to catch those. So again, they would use these birds for their meat and the eggs. Also mammals, larger mammals like these black, black tailed deer, the tule elk that you see there on the right. And the one that's doing the funny jumping is a pronghorn antelope. So again, they were great hunters and they were able to wisely use that resource. They were very respectful of those animals. If they took an animal's life, um, there was a whole ceremony before they would go hunting and a ceremony after, and just about every piece of that animal would then be used for something in their lifestyle. You also had smaller mammals, ground squirrels and rabbits and hares, wood rats. Again, these are animals that are very fast movers. Think about how they would have had to hunt them, how they would have had to catch them. Okay. And also shellfish. So you've got to remember thousands of years ago, no buildings, no concrete. We had a lot more waterways. So our wetlands were bigger, the bay area was bigger, um, rivers were bigger. All those, many of those have been covered up now, um, have been piped through our drains um, and have disappeared. But again, the, right from the mud bay, the close area to the um, Bay Area, they would find these small oysters and clams that you see on top of the page. You see those would be the smaller ones. Again, those are usually a bivalve and it was open up when they cooked it and that would leave the squishy animal inside that would be cooked that they could eat. Then they would use the clams um, and other decorations and all for their ceremonies. Now, back in the ocean though, they probably traded with some of the other coastal tribes for these larger animals. This larger picture at the bottom, you see three abalone. Can you find the three abalone? There's one up, one just squirted out. There's another one, another one on the back of the rock. And then this orange thing, that is a sea anemone, okay? So they were also, very good swimmers. <laughs> they would have to be able to swim, hold their, hold their breath and be able to pry this abalone. Here's the abalone shell. So the abalone is a univalve. It is just the seashell, the one shell that the animal, squishy animal makes. The squishy animal would be on the inside and would suck down on the rock. So they would have to sometimes use tools to be able to pry those abalone off of those rocks. And again, you saw they would use these as their bowls. Parts of them would also break off. They could use for um, hunting tools and all as well. The inside you may recognize as the mother of pearl. That's used in a lot of jewelry. So again, that's our abalone there. And again, they may have traded um, arrowheads or they may have traded uh, basketry that they use or made and created. Um, all of these would be forms that they could trade if they couldn't access the abalones and all themselves. All right, so our plants that were used in our aloni food, you see this dish and you see the abalone shell in the back. Remember those black, those are the mussels. They're kind of like a clam. I see some smaller clams in there. You guys recognize anything in that bowl? 
bread, but not bread brought from the store. <laughs> that would have been, um, there's some other, do you see some nuts? Do you maybe recognize some of those berries? All right, so again, almost any part of the plant. So they, again, were very good botanist as well. So let's look at some of our plants and let's see what we can eat. So as they are foraging, and this is Vincent um, that has the Ohlone restaurant that would be out foraging, collecting the food, wouldn't go to, from the grocery store, would actually collect it. So they would look for acorns, like your oak and the buckeye. They would use that for flour. That's what would make that bread or those muffins that you saw. The nuts that they could eat whole would be the pepper nuts and the walnuts. They would find aquatic plants like your tulies and your cattails. So here I have a piece of cattail. Again, it has the green leaves that are kind of flat. And then it has these brown seeds that again, once they mature, they become a fluff and can be a flower. The tulies are these thinner green pieces. Again, a long tule reed. Um, berries and other fruits like the elderberry and the holly leaf cherry. All right, so as we get a closer look at these oaks, many different types of oak trees, that's looking at the acorns that are just, um, have just come out. Now you wouldn't want to eat an acorn off of the ground because that probably has a caterpillar and a moth comes out of it. Um, so you wouldn't want to eat that necessarily. But, and if it drops the cap, then it's already done. It's kind of overripe. You don't want to eat these green ones because they're not going to taste right. Um, they're not ripe enough yet. So out of these live blue, valley, and black, those acorns all would have a different flavor. Okay? They would all have a little different taste. So once they would, um, in the fall when the oaks are ready, they would shake those branches, collect those acorns, and then they would have to process them. Okay, one of the main food sources of the Lonies were these acorns. So you see some of these acorns, now that they're brown, they're ready to eat. So again, the caps you don't eat, okay? The caps would come off. And then you see here, there's a, a rock, two rocks where they're pounding and they're cracking the acorn because you have to crack that hard outside husk to be able to get to the nut that's inside. So in this other picture, top picture, you can see some of those smaller nuts, kind of like a regular, any of the irregular uh, nuts that you have a hard husk on the outside. But think how long it would take you if you were using two rocks, okay, to be able to separate that. Now here's another way. The Alonis would gather the acorns and with this um, mortar and pestle will chop it to make their small grain and then they would make mush out of it. All right, so again, you're still chopping, but you see how that natural rock has created this bowl, okay? So that would be, they would use like a sandstone or something that would um, eventually has a hole all the way through. And that would again, crush up those husks. So then you'd have to separate it out. They would have to be rinsed because they are full of tannins that would make it bitter. So if you didn't want a bitter um, mush then, or a bitter biscuit, then you'd want to rinse that well. Then eventually you'd be able to make something like this. Now, again, this you see is something that uh, Vincent could have made at his Ohlone Cafe. There's lots of recipes, but it's in a glass dish. So again, as an Ohlone living thousands of years ago, you wouldn't have a glass dish. You'd have to again, come up with some container that could um, be steamed or go near a fire or use those hot rocks, things like that. All right, so again, it would take a while to do that. So again, as a quicker way though, we found that they also used what's called a grinding stone. So let's look at this. Thank <laughs> you. 
to make into different products. So a nice fine flour. Remember they didn't have freezers or anything though. They'd have to find a way to store it. And this was one of their ways. They would make these little tule huts that were used as granaries to store the nuts um, and the flowers. And then this picture is again, a way of making another kind of soup like an acorn mush. Now you notice she's using a basket. They were able to weave baskets tight enough that they were waterproof. And if you look at those handles that she's using, those are just pieces of oak branches or willows that were formed to be able to move a rock around. And that rock is a piece of obsidian or basalt, probably an obsidian, the, um, not any kind of rock you can put in a fire. Sometimes they'll explode if there's water on the inside. But you see how this rock would be put in the fire, rock would get hot, then it would be put into container of water to wash off the ash, because you wouldn't want all the wood ash in your soup. And then she's got to continually move that rock around so that it doesn't burn a hole in her basket, because then she wouldn't be able to make her soup. So again, it would take quite the process. All right, let's listen to Dr. Joyce. The Ohlone's had many trees in which they ate from. This is a walnut tree. You can start seeing California grapes growing. They're just starting. And then you have tulies in the background and oak trees. The acorns from the oak trees was the staple of their existence. All right, and that's at Tulipons. You hear some of the geese and the ducks in the background. All right, so this is a buckeye that's just on the other side of that oak tree. And let's listen um, look closer at this. This is a buckeye tree that's flowering, getting ready to produce its big seeds. And these big seeds, again, they would roast them. Um, they would have to mash them. They could create flour with them, all kinds. And it's called a buckeye because the seed is very large, like the eye of a deer or a buck, a male deer. Um, so again, these buckeyes, the outside part though is a little bit toxic. <laughs> so they did discover though that by rinsing, the toxic would come off in the water. They could throw the water into a shallow area and that would be enough to stun fish it wouldn't kill them, it would just stun them, but then they could harvest those fish quickly. So it's a quick way to fish. All right, so here's a closer look at the buckeye in the winter. You see that fruit is hanging on. Look at the picture down at the bottom. You can see that big brown fruit. It's got a real thick husk on the outside. So that's your California buckeye. This is a black walnut. Notice it is compound leaves and it has a nut that many native animals, especially small mammals, will eat. So this is different than the walnuts that you buy in the store. Um, if you've ever wondered why they call them black walnuts, as you try to get that husk off, um, it makes your hands black. <laughs> There's a dye all in it. Um, the nuts are eaten, the nuts are great. They have a great flavor, again, for animals as well as humans. <laughs> This is a California bay laurel. It's a little different than its cousin, the Mediterranean bay leaf, which a lot of people use in Western foods. This was used by the Ohlone's not only for a spice, a very spicy spice, but also for uh, getting rid of small ants as they would put these leaves around their huts. All right, and you see that nut doesn't have as thick of a husk. So that one would be a little bit easier to get to. Now your holly leaf cherry, again, we spend a lot of time in the summer when we're at tulipons eating these um, little cherries. This is a holly leaf cherry, and you can see it is just starting to flower. Some of the little holly leaf cherries are on there, but this is, was an important plant for the Ohlone's. Okay, so again, all different types. There's a, a red and a yellow. Look at this one. So you see the fruits are not quite ready yet. See how small those yellow, they're kind of greenish and they're not ripe enough yet. Um, 
there's a big yellow one. Those are usually more sweet, I think, than the red ones. The red ones are a little more tart. But that's something where you're out walking around, you're gathering your dinner, um, or you're just out goofing around as a kid, you could simply reach up if you knew the tree and eat your fruit. So you'd have a snack ready made. Same today as if you have a vegetable garden and you walk by and you want to grab a carrot or a tomato to eat. Okay. So again, they would know what they could and could not eat. So these again are hazelnuts, California hazelnut. If you look at it on the tree, it looks kind of like a filbert fig. Okay. Um, but again, inside that husk is the actual nut there. It's a small little tree. They'd had lots of different berries. Remember from that first fruit bowl that we looked at or the, the vegetable bowl? Um, you see the blackberries. We have the California blackberry and we also have an invasive type as well. Um, but they did have a native California blackberry. You see the manzanita berries, the huckleberries. Now they would also know that they would have to maintain these open areas, the open meadows. So again, they were very good at their ecology. They knew that they would have to set small fires to keep the brush burned down because the uh, things like the huckleberry only grow where they have a lot of sunshine. And if they have the huckleberries growing, then they know they have the bear coming. So again, they knew how to manage their land um, to get the best products that they could. So again, lots of berries were harvested. Some berries were used even as medicine. So things like the coffee berry. Now this is different than the coffee that your mom and dad drink, but this berry, if you made a tea out of it, it would make you go to the bathroom, okay? And the snowberry, the gooseberry, the snowberry would make you very, very sleepy. So it was important to know which plants were which. And that was taught through generations. You learned it from your parents, parents learned it from their grandparents, and that information was passed on. Chechenya language was not a written recorded language. So again, it was passed on through generations. They also had the blue elderberry. And there you see the then and now. You see the tiny little blue elderberries could be made into a jam or a jelly or just eaten as the berry. Today, we use it as a liqueur and wine and pies and syrup. And you even see these as um, medicinal, like they're going to help your immune system, the Sambuca. That's the scientific name for the elderberry. They would look for roots and underground stems. So if you look at this picture on the right, it just looks like a bunch of grass, right? No, they would know exactly what was what. The white ones, those are some of the wild onions and hiding in the back would be some garlic that would be down in the ground. Again, the wild carrots and the mushrooms. So they would know exactly, it wouldn't just be a field of grass. They would know exactly what those plants were. Very good botanist. Now, again, because our waterways were larger, they were able to harvest aquatic plants. And here you see some clips of this cattail. Now the cattail again is this one that I have right here. So this brown part is where the seeds are. As those seeds develop, it becomes very fluffy and they could use that um, as flower as well. But these aquatic plants don't have a regular structure like a land plant. Um, all of the stems could usually be eaten and even the roots or the rhizomes could be eaten. And then you see some other rushes and sedges on the side too could be harvested. So let's listen to this part on cattails. Here is Tyson's Lagoon and in the forefront we have cattails. Now cattails were used by the Ohlone's for food, uh, especially it has like a celery-like texture. They also use the seeds of the cattail and possibly they used the fluffy mature seeds in their dispersal mechanism as a diaper, very absorbent material. Hmm. Now, if you've been to other Thule classes, you may have learned a little bit about what they used to wear. Um, they would wear skins of animals or actually the Thule's they would make into skirts or aprons. But if you had a little baby, you couldn't go to the store and get diapers. Um, they would usually use kind of a little papoose thing and it would, again, you could fill it up with this and it would absorb all that um, pee and poop from the baby. It wouldn't be running all over the place. So again, this is looking at the cattails. See how their leaves are long and skinny, kind of flat. All right. So again, 
as far as eating this cattail, this would be like going to the grocery store. They could get a lot of different products from this plant. The rhizomes, again, that are down underneath in the water, that's a rich um, energy source. Certain times of the year, again, things are only available. So you have to harvest what's in season, okay? It's no different than our grocery store. Um, plants and or the fruits and vegetables that are in season are gonna be cheaper than those that are out of season. All right, so you also see the leaves could be eaten, the flower spikes. So again, it would be kind of like a grocery store. Nice. I start by cutting the roots from the base of the stalk. The roots are valuable because they are packed with starch, but I won't be processing those today. I then separate the leaves from around the stalk. As you can see, there is a clear slime that can be found underneath the leaves. Although it looks gross, this slime can be used as medicine. It is a natural antiseptic and analgesic. This means it can be used to keep wounds clean while at the same time relieving pain and inflammation. For centuries, cattail jelly has been popular for treating and relieving sunburn, bug bites, toothaches, cuts, bruises, and more. Anyway, back to the task at hand. Most field guides suggest cutting the stalk at four inches, but you don't have to be strict with that number. As long as the stalk is tender, that's all that matters. The white part is obviously the most tender, so judging by that, I figured I could get away with cutting them at around six inches. So he's using a metal knife. Remember, they didn't have metal. They would have used a sharp stone. Here's what the end of the stalk looks like. As you can see, it is made up of several different layers. Kind of looks like celery. I'd like to draw your attention to the core, which is sticking out slightly from the end of the stalk. This is what I'll be eating. The outer layers are too fibrous to eat, but the core is tender enough to eat raw. Although I have eaten cattail shoots raw before, I like them best when they're cooked. Okay, so again, kind of the when the gooey stuff, it's kind of like the aloe plant, you know, that we use sometimes for burns and cuts. So again, that information would have been passed on through generations. Now that was the cattail. This is the tule. See how the shape of the tule is skinny? It goes all the way up and it doesn't have, it's got a few little seeds on top, but it doesn't have um, the big brown seeds. Again, aquatic plant lives in the water and these tules actually help clean the water. That's why we use them in that storm water retention at um, tule ponds, because it actually helps clean the waters. The heavy metals bind to a, a fungus that's on the, the roots. So it's actually cleaning the water, as well as it's a great habitat for lots of different types of animals. But again, all these different parts could be eaten. Again, probably tasted a lot like celery. <laughs> all right, but these tulies, they also found out that once you cut them, if you let them dry straight, if they weren't bent, then they could be, once they dry, they, you could re-wet them, and then you could mold them into different things. So you see here, one of our tule huts. So we now have a tule hut um, that you can go inside, and that would be for a small family. That's made with like the willow, see the pieces of wood, the willow branches, and then the tules again would be a waterproof roof, and you see the wally or the tule boat. So even those reeds could be put together as um, a boat for one or two people. You'd kind of kneel in it. It would work like a kayak does today. Um, again, these two projects were created by some Eagle Scouts. And then again, sometimes they would make these long houses for larger gathering areas. But again, these toolies would be used for their clothes, um, the boats, toys, all kinds of things. So if you think about it, the way that we, we've covered kind of how we cook things and how they did, um, Think about how you would have to clean up and go to the bathroom. Okay, think about what you use. So our soaps today are made out of the fats from animal fats or animal oils. And if you think of this brand, the palm olive, I don't know if you've ever figured out, it came from the palm and the olive trees. Okay, kind of interesting, huh? And our toilet paper came comes from trees, it's manufactured. 
But what would they have used? Well, they would have used this little flower. This is your cyanosis, and we're going to see if we can make some soap. You put water on it, and then you rub it, and it will start with a lather, as you can see there. Now you can wash your hands. Pretty cool. And that's natural soap from the cyanosis, California lilac. All right, that's pretty cool, huh? Again, it would be passed down. There would also be this soap root that, um, again, they could use that to clean lots of things, but it had kind of a fibrousy end. So it's almost like soap suds with a brush on it. All right, so, but what would they do for toilet paper? We have the toilet paper tree called the sycamore. And as you can see, the sycamore, it makes a very large leaf. It's palmate, like a hand and it's very soft and fuzzy, okay? So if you needed something to wipe your bum, the sycamore tree is it, the leaves. You'd make sure you know the difference between a sycamore leaf and a poison oak leaf, right? That could be dangerous. All right, now for the ceremony part, this you will see they are dressed up in their regalia and this is at a ceremony at the at Ohlone Cemetery here in Fremont. But notice again, this is kind of like when you guys get dressed up for something special, um, a special occasion, this, they would get dressed up in their regalia. So pay attention to what's in their regalia. And I also wanted to show you this um, stick, okay? So you will see the men on the outside are using this and that's their clapper stick. It's made from the stem of an elderberry. It's just hollowed out, but you will not hear any percussion drums. The elderberry sticks are their percussion. So here we go. from the regalia you see the women and men are wearing different things the men are have they have uh, the tule skirts with a little bit of deer skin on the outside and then that is an otter pelt that's around their stomach then i see a lot of the turkey feathers on the front and again they use local paints they used um, rocks and stones to and muds to decorate themselves with the paints the women you see more of the hides um, those would be from the foxes, um, deers, um, bears, different animals. Again, you see the deer skins and also the tulies, and you see their hats. And did you notice their clapper sticks, how they were doing? So each motion means something in this particular dance. All right, here is a story from Desiree. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Desiree Munoz. Today is Sunday, October 5th, 2000, and I believe eight. And I'm 16 years old, and I am a member of the Costanor Rumson Carmel Tribe, Ohlone. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of information on going back to seven generations ago of how our people used to wear their regalia proudly. I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about our hat. Our hat is basically from back in those days was made out of tule or willow and it was formed around to be around and to fit your head and and the type of feathers that you are allowed to use in your hat would be pheasant, duck, hawk, or eagle. But it depends on how high in bloodline that you are. Like me, I am Tony Serta, which is our chief. I am his granddaughter. So I could be allowed to wear eagle feathers. So it doesn't matter if you would or if you wouldn't. But me, personally, I am... I am a big fan of the Blue Jay. So my hat is covered in pheasant with Blue Jay feathers. Okay, 
So again, gives you a good look at their different types of regalia, looking at hers. Again, you saw the furs, um, they would use seashells and small rocks or beans to um, help decorate up and to help make some noises. Again, they talked about the hat. So we for years thought this basket that we had, we thought it was a basket, it's actually a hat. So it was formed to fit their head and then decorated with their feathers. Now, a lot of the raptor feathers, those are protected by law. So as far as those feathers, you can't own a feather of um, like owls and hawks, um, but like the geese feathers that I have over here, turkeys, um, those and all you could have. And in a lot of the powwows and all, they may cut these up, they may paint them different colors um, to represent some of those different animals. Now, you've got in your handout that your teachers will get to you, you've got um, directions to make a headband. And so there are feathers here of the eagle is on this side and the hawk, okay? So again, these feathers would be passed down through generations um, if they're federally protected kind of feathers, but you saw Desiree, she liked the blue bird ones. So again, sometimes they would put beads and all on them, also use them as fans. But in your activity here, we're just gonna simply make a headband. And you saw that some of the feathers were mounted in the front, but you can mount in the back. This totally up to you. But if you have a small strip we won't make you go out and do toolies and make your own cordage, but you could just use something like this, like a um, construction paper. And then these are some symbols, not necessarily used by the Ohlone, but just some general um, Native American symbols and tell us a quick story. Now we have found some other pictographs and all um, from the Ohlone's, but again, this is just an example for you to come up with a story that you would like to let us know and then attach your feathers. So it's up to you to color those feathers however um, you would like. <laughs> 